Hey, 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 closet busters, come on and gather around. It's time once again to kick down those closet doors of life. We're here to escape our BS, explore our fears, and elevate our self-expression. I'm your host, Rick Clemens, bold move expert and coming out coach, and I'm going to take you to the party, the pulpit, the wake, and back to the party of living your life uncloseted. So come on, grab hold of yourself and get ready to step out, step up, and step in to living your truth as we explore more stories, tips, and tricks for living your life uncloseted. Now let's get to the show. Hey, 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 closet dwellers and bold move makers. It is time once again for Life Uncloseted. And you know what? Sometimes you've just got to get older, wiser, better, and bolder because you know what? For so many of us, especially, and this is, I'm going to be talking to the LGBTQ people today, but I want you straight people to be listening to because here's the thing. Nobody really taught us how to date when we were in high school, especially those of us of the LGBTQ persuasion. We had our crushes and all that sort of stuff, but we had to keep it hidden. And even you straight people had to hide some stuff because you'd have a crush that you couldn't talk about because you were afraid people would think you were weird or whatever. And then here's what happens, especially for us gay men, is all that craziness that goes on in high school and learning to date and all that stuff, we didn't get to do it. But we seemed to be the one that everybody else came to and cried on and all that sort of stuff. And then suddenly, here we are, late 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, sometimes even 60s, and we're suddenly realizing, I'm gay, and I don't have a freaking idea how to do this dating thing. And then suddenly, we are the kid in the candy store, and you've heard me talk about this before, but what I love about where we're going today is, it's truly about diving into that mind of the gay man, and really understanding when are you going to grow up and when are you going to mature and really realize it's time for you to live boldly as who you are and do the stuff that makes you the best guy you're meant to be. And I found a guest today through one of my buddies who's in PR. And Jack Tracy is actually an actor. He's on a show called History. He's also a singer-songwriter. He has just put out a new song called Older which is the whole reason I wanted him on this show, because as soon as I heard it and knew the background to it, I'm like, yes, we need to have this conversation about gay men getting older and really owning who they are. And I think we're going to dish on some stuff. We're going to talk about what it is that makes gay men do the things they do and why they need to grow up and start adulting. Because you know what? His music is all about older grown folk and doing what they're meant to do. So welcome to the podcast, Jack. I'm really excited to have you here, man. Thank you so much for having me. Of course. So you, you've got quite the, quite the stuff going on. You're a pretty busy guy. You're doing music. You're doing the show, all that good stuff. And in the midst of this, you're like, okay, I'm going to start teaching some of these gay bitches exactly what they're supposed to be doing in life. So what, <laughs> what kind of brought that whole thing around, man, to be the older and all that stuff? Well, well, you know, if I'm doing that, if I'm, if I'm as, as to quote you, if I'm, if I'm teaching some gay bitches how to live their lives, I'm doing it through example. I'm definitely not here to, to uh, be on a pedestal and talk down to anybody. I'm just trying to do the best Jack Tracy that I can do. Yeah. And I wished that growing up, I had seen people doing that in the media that were from my community. I wished I had seen open and out gay actors, uh, open and out gay musicians and singers. And of course we had some, but to right. really see them grow and mature and find their way, because that's the way that we all find our paths. We look to people who have done it before. We look to people that we relate to and we try to see ourselves in them. And, you know, what do, what do we do? We look to, what are our cultural references? Sex and the City, Golden Girls, now, you know, Will and Grace and right. Queer as Folk coming along and this and that. But, you know, I don't, I, I'm very aware that growing up, we all talked about, like, I'm the Dorothy or I'm the Samantha or I'm the this. And it's like, well, why can't we be the fill in a gay character, who, you know, who is in media or in our lives? And I just really wanted to, to create a production company that put out movies and music and series and all sorts of art forms that portrayed gay people as the protagonists living their lives where the stories and messages were not about the act of being gay, not about coming out of the closet, not about dealing with religion, not about dealing with AIDS, though we certainly touch on these topics because they're very prevalent, but just being people. I just want to see gay people being people in stories that are universal. Yeah. 
And I think it's important for these stories to be told, not only for the young, but I'm going to go kind of to my generation because I'm much older than you. And it's that baby boomer generation too, that these people are still coming out of the closet too. So they need some role models to be seen. It's like, they need to see, we need to see multi-generational role models. And I don't, I don't even really like the word role model. I want people to just see life models. Here's what's happening. Yeah. Two guys are living together. Oh, by the way, they happen to have a kid. And guess what? They're teenagers just as much a pain in the ass as every heterosexual teenager out there. You know, any couple that has it. And it's like, we just do life. It's that simple. And, and you know, with the, with the political system and what we're dealing with right now in the States, um, it, how where where gay politics has gone, where the where the U.S. has gone in terms of public opinion to the LGBT community, where gay rights have progressed, it's very clear to me that the key to all of it is visibility, because you're you're going to reach a good segment of the people by um, by saying what's right and what's moral and what's ethical and what's legal and. Uh, talking about anti-discrimination and talking about acceptance, or I hate the word tolerance, but you know, right. if it works for right. some people, great. That's part of the way. But people who you're not going to reach with that message, what you're going to reach them by is them over periods of years just seeing us as part of the society and just like everybody else mm-hmm. with the same problems and the same issues and trying to deal with life the same way. There is great, I think, you know, I mentioned Will and Grace already, but for me, just to see, even if it was a screwball comedy, but just to see, oh, this is a way some people live their lives, and oh, right. they have dating problems too, and they have friends, and they have money problems, that works for a good amount of the, of people who are not going to, they're not going to call themselves liberals, they're not going to call themselves, you know, Democrats, they're not going to... They're not going to jump on board with the the political side of it, but they might see you and, you know, respect you and understand you if they just see you out there living your life. But you just hit on something that is important. It is the they are going to understand you just because you understand someone doesn't necessarily you're going to agree with their beliefs or the way they live their life. But the understanding is, okay. now I understand you. I get you more doesn't Mm -hmm. mean I'm going to embrace you and say, okay, we're best friends. But if I can really understand your frame, your perspective on life, your view of the world, doesn't mean I'm going to say, okay, yeah, okay, let's be best friends. But it helps me be more empathetic to you. And I think this is what you're bringing forward is the more we can do this. And I have to say, and I love my, I love our community, but this is where I think we we kind of trip and stumble sometimes is we're not willing to go to this next level of Okay, let's let's really try to understand somebody else. Yes, we have been marginalized. Yes, we get beat the shit out of all the time. Blah, 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 blah. I'm tired of the blah, blah. Let's be the model, so to speak. Let's go that extra mile and see if we can't break down some barriers ourselves by going, let me understand you. Help me understand this. And I don't think Mm -hmm. we have enough of asking that question anymore. And and by doing that, what you're doing is you're you're taking away the ability of bad actors to make you the other. Mm -hmm. Because if someone goes to a group of people, say someone goes to the Midwest and says, yeah, the people who are really to blame for the degradation of morality in our society are the gays. If, If those group of people have not seen gays, don't know anything about gays, have never met gays, maybe have heard about some kid at school or maybe that guy down the street or whatever, but really have no experience or, or visibility into it. It's easier to convince those people that, yeah, those guys over there who I know nothing about and have never seen. And I only know about them what I'm being told about them by this group of bad actors. But if those same group of people go to a society and says, you know, Oh, the real problem are the gays. And they go, what you mean, Carl, my neighbor, but you mean like, no, no, of course, that's stupid. I don't accept that. I don't accept the picture you're painting because I know these people. Right. And that's why visibility works. That's mm-hmm. why you, you, it's, a, it's a multi-pronged approach to you know, making sure that we have our equality in society, that we're treated without discrimination. It's the legal side, it's the politics side, but it's also just being seen so that when someone tries to paint you in a certain way, it doesn't work because people know you. 
Um, you know, that's why in, you know, the, the recent uh, brush up where, you know, Trump is going after trans people in the military, right. you know, who was very vocal against this policy, the military, right? The people who actually serve with fellow trans officers, they were against this policy. They, they wrote a press release saying that they were against what Trump was doing because they actually know these people. They work with these people. They know that the policy is bullshit. Right. That's the power of visibility. Right. Well, and the the visibility thing into what you just brought up too is, you know, we could go, we could go off on this for, for the rest of the conversation, but yeah. it's all about him just pandering to his base. He's going to jump, he's going to jump from thing to thing. If, Oh, this will get me more attention. Oh, this will get these people's, you know, and the thing is the logical people in the world, most of them are seeing this and go, okay, we're, we're going to have to work through this until we don't have to work with this anymore. That's the thing. And I, I love what you said about being seen so that someone, if they do that picture, they just, it's not going to work because if my husband and I are walking down the street and actually this happened even in the last couple of days, we went, I don't even remember where we were. Oh, we were at a, a wine event last night and mm -hmm. we sat down. We, we were at a, in a big group of people. It was outdoors. It was music. It was wine. It was pizza, all this sort of stuff. We sat down and started chatting with the couple next to us and nothing ever came up about who we were. And then finally they said, Oh, you guys here, you know, uh, you know, alone without your spouses. And we both looked at each other and said, no, we're here with our spouse. We are spouses. <laughs> And yeah. they're like, oh, wow, I guess we kind of made an assumption there. And they kind of, they felt really embarrassed, but they were cool with it because they're like, yeah. I, you know, sometimes we all step into this. I know sometimes I step into this as a gay man with heterosexuals and I'll make an assumption. And I'm like, God, I just, I put my foot way in my mouth and on down my intestines and, you know, clear out my ass with that one because I made the assumption that this is what somebody was. Yeah, I have a real problem with people on our side that get that get overly pissed off at, you know, that that the assumption was made. Look, we're the minority. Like mm -hmm. if you we're, of course, it's just human nature to assume that something you're seeing is like something you see more of than something you see less of. Like mm -hmm. when we get all up in arms about you you assumed that I was straight or you assumed that I was this and I'm, you know, I'll say something dangerous, you know, you assumed I was this gender versus this gender based on my, you know, presentation. Well, yes, they did. If, if you look like a woman or you look like a man in their experience, they'll use the wrong pronoun, you'll correct them, and then everything's fine. Right. Like, right. the offense level that we have, the guard that we have up, how easily we're wounded, how easily we're triggered, really, it, it hurts us because we have to understand, we have to meet people where they are. And we have to understand that people are going to assume that something they see is the more likely option and not the less likely option. And that's just human. Like, that's just the way it works. Yes. And I always challenge our own um, internal community with things like, okay, so when you look at a child, you see a child in a stroller and you don't know if it's a boy or girl because it's brand newborn. Mm -hmm. How do you address that? Because all of us as humans are going to go, oh, what a cute baby. Great. Or do we go, oh, what a cute little boy. And then the parent goes, no, it's actually a girl. Because this is going to happen. And it's like, I want all of us in our community to go back to those moments. <laughs> because yeah. every day there's going to be something we're going to make an assumption on. And take, take that even further. Like, I, I would push even further to say that, and why does it matter? Exactly. exactly. Why, does, why does it matter is... Because then, I mean, then, then you take, well, let me be super gay. Then you take us to, you know, Madonna's what it feels like for a girl. And, you know, yeah, it, it would be, it would be degrading to mistake a boy baby for a girl, but it wouldn't be degrading to mistake a girl baby for a boy. And now you've got, you know, our internalized misogyny throughout our society. It doesn't, can I swear on this? Of course you can. <laughs> I've been oh, saying, I've been I, saying I, I, I've gotta, yeah. yeah. It doesn't fucking matter. It doesn't fucking matter. You correct them, and as long as they're not an asshole about the correction, they take the correction and go with it, then it's all fine. We're good. Let and people think, take the correction. Right, and I don't think we give breath and space for the corrections to be had. Instead, you need People need a permission structure to be wrong. Yeah. Pe people need, and I'm, I'm just, not just this conversation, I think it's po politics, it's across the board. We have, we are, we can, and I am guilty of this myself. I 
fight trolls on, on Facebook when I feel when I'm bored every day. We have to give people the permission to be wrong so that they can come to our point of view or at least empathize with us. If we don't make it safe to be wrong, think of it, it's hard to say you're wrong. It's hard to ask for forgiveness. It's hard to any point of view that you have to change it. And so if you're asking that for someone else, from someone else, you have to make it safe. You have to give them, God, I hate this term. You have to give them a safe space to be wrong. Mm -hmm. Our community is all about wanting a safe space and trigger warnings and all of that. Well, what about that for, and listen, I have no sympathy for people with bigoted views, but I'm a practical person. Like right. you want them on our side, give them the safe space to be wrong so they can be. Right. If you don't give them the safe space to be wrong, they're never going to be, and we haven't helped anything. Well, I mean, let's be honest here. You can't learn to be right until you've been wrong. Yeah. <laughs> it's that simple. And, and so if you make it very, very painful to be wrong, you're going to do everything you can to not be wrong. Exactly. And exactly. you'll convince yourself into anything. Yeah. And you'll create, you know, rhetorical webs and whataboutisms and, you know, whatever mm -hmm whatever tools you need to make sure that you don't have to admit that you're wrong, if being wrong is something scary. And listen, I'm saying this about who I consider to be people on the other side of issues, but sure. it applies there just as much to ourselves. Yeah. So in the work that you do, because you're, you're playing in the entertainment world and a couple of different realms, everything from doing movies and shows to the music and everything, <clears throat> this space to be wrong, you probably have come across this numerous times in the work that you do because everybody's like okay well hollywood this and of course now we have the whole me too movement thing so this this is uh, i love me too because and everybody kind of not everybody so i'm going to re-say this a lot of people get on my back about this when i say what i'm about to say but i love the me too movement because it's opened the doors for so many other me too movements to come to the surface me too i'm a guy who doesn't feel comfortable being vulnerable me too i'm a wallflower who really would rather can people just leave me the fuck alone because i want to be a wallflower there's so many me too stories wrapped up in this and i don't want to take away from the true me too movement but i love it because it opened the doorway for so many of us to say hey hello me too so you as a guy in entertainment I'm sure you have dealt with this on numerous fronts where I don't feel like I have the space to do some stuff until you finally take a stand. So has that happened to you over the years in this world? Well, hmm, let's think about that. So with the Me Too movement, you know, we, I've addressed that a little bit in my uh, web series, Big law, we yeah. touched on that. We, I do my best to touch on everything that's topical. And I can understand why. I see the point of view of why someone might take umbrage to that because you you corrected for it in your statement, I think, which is yeah. that you're not taking anything away from it. I think people, no. a gut reaction might be like, no, 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 we, you know, don't take anything away from this movement by saying, you know, it could lead to other things. Let's focus on this movement because it's very right. important right. and women are being assaulted. And I think it, it, it of course, um, to not take it away from it, I think your underlying point is that this is an example of people connecting through mm -hmm. our shared experience and becoming stronger because of it, because they, because we're strong. Oh well, God, now I'm Hillary. We're stronger together. Right. We're stronger to we're stronger together because we can, we can have the courage to say something that we've gone through and then look around and see other people standing up as well saying, I've gone through this terrible or traumatic thing as well. Now, so I think that I agree with you that 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 ability to break through shame, mm -hmm. to break through um, um, whatever the barrier is to prevent you from saying what you've gone through or what you've mm -hmm. been through, um, shame, embarrassment, um, um, just the sadness, just the emotions that must yep. overtake you yep. to even bring it up. Being able to push through that and then be greeted with this community that says, you know, me too, and being drawing strength from that and being stronger together, that is a great thing. And, and I can understand, I, I understand why, why, why we need to be very protective of the Me Too movement to not dilute mm -hmm. it because, because we're, we're, we're really, there's a difference between, you know, 
me too, I've gone through this, you know, emotional thing and me too, I've been assaulted and raped. Like they're right. very different right. things. So we need to protect the potent of this. Absolutely. Movement. And that's my point. But, but I get your under, I get your underlying point that you just the power of stepping up, feeling, the, feeling the ability to step up, say what you've gone through and connect with another human being because of it. Mm hmm. Exceedingly powerful, and we've absolutely been through that in you know the work with necessary out of production. So yeah, yeah. well, the, I think the, other, the other thing that comes to mind as you were talking is this interesting space where, and I, this just happened for me a few months ago. Um, I was actually at National Speakers Association conference and did a workshop where we had three people on the panel, um, two gay men and a lesbian, and we talked about the power of learning from our community as speakers, all speakers, about the power of rejection and marginalizing oh. and not having a voice. Because who better to learn from this than people who have already been through this? And what can you learn as a speaker about taking the rejection, trying to find the right acceptance, trying to fit in in the place? And it was a very powerful workshop that we did because we actually had a few allies. And now I think this is going to be one of the main workshops next year because this is where we band together and you create the empathy and you create the understanding. And this is the power of if we start to open our minds and hearts and ears and step into like a me too movement and go, okay, let me help really understand these women. Now that I understand what they've gone through, how do I then connect better in the mm -hmm. world? That to me is the key. How do I then connect better? In fact, there's a, a new web, I'm going to call it a web series, Man Enough Now, or We Are Man Enough. And they're starting to address some of this masculinity stuff, which is another part of my work. All of mm. these things are about creating connection. Even yeah. what you're doing with the song Older is about creating the connection of, we are all 30-some-year-old gay men at some point in time. We are all 40-some-year-old gay men. Yet, we bash ourselves so much of the time in those communities. Instead of going, wait, I'm 30 something like you and I get this. This is where the power yeah. of connection begins to happen. Well, it's, it, it, and the power of, the power of connection can only be, ha can only happen if voices are given to people of different perspectives. And we're seeing that happen, not enough, but we're seeing that happen in the media. media. We're seeing, non-conventional shows and topics and leads and actors and actresses, there's still a lot of work to be done. But, you know, in doing, in forming necessary outlet productions and producing my web series history, the album Older, um, my new movie Snowflake, which is, takes place in a Trump-like political structure and deals with the LGBTQ angles of that. Um, Big Law, all of the work is about Saying my taking these taking these art forms and being able to say my perspective as one person with one kind of experience in a very diverse community and speaking it truthfully and honestly without sugarcoating, without you know, we, we have a we have a, this unique ability in the gay community and in gay media to always portray ourselves as the hero of our own stories mm -hmm. and it's perfectly understandable because how long you know has someone like you or i maybe not so much the current generation but you or i grown up as being the bet the villain or the bad person in society we were the people rejected we were the outsiders we were the people who weren't right we were the people who needed to be changed and so of course when we start making media we make it you know we make ourselves the good guys and the protagonists where, you know, that makes total sense. Mm -hmm. I'm now interested in making, in making content that points out the lightness and the darkness within our community mm -hmm. in pointing out so that we can all relate together, realize that we're all really the same, reach out to straight people as well to show that, you know, just because we're dealing it with it, you know, in the context of gay relationships and friendships and our lifestyles, it's all the same shit you guys deal with. Yep. Um, and, and, and then foster that connection. Um, mm -hmm. We have gotten some amazing, like incredible fan letters. I never thought I would create something 
a show that I would then go to my inbox the next morning and get like a four page letter from someone writing about how they felt like they weren't alone and they were validated because they felt the same way as a character in one of the shows. We've gotten, and we post them all on the website. It's, it's amazing how many of those we get. And in the, in the darkest times of trying to do all of this, which can be, you know, the administrative side of it and the money side of it can be extremely grueling. I do everything myself. Yeah. Um, reading those letters really just puts it in perspective of like, this is what it's all about. Like, this is what it's, this is what I'm, I'm doing. I'm doing it on a small scale. I would love to do it on a bigger scale, but this is why I've got to keep going. Mm -hmm. So if you could share with the audience why you feel so compelled to do this, I mean, I've heard it in the under underlines of what you just said, but why does Jack do what he's doing right now? What's the compelling reason? So I, so my background is I was a musical theater major at, uh, in college because I'm a big homosexual and, um, I left that world because I just never felt like I fit in with it. Um, I just, I, I didn't fit in with the community of that world. Mm -hmm. So I went into law and uh, became a fairly, fairly successful attorney here in New York, which I still do for my, for my money. Um, and, you know, I had a partner, we lived together. Uh, we had our circle of friends. We worked hard. We took vacations. We worked until our vacations. We, went to the bars, went to see shows, sure. and there was a point, I think I was 31, where I just, I just said, is, is this it? Mm -hmm. is, is, is this it? Like, I'm going right. to work at this big law firm, I'm going to slowly improve what apartment I live in, I'm going to go to events and see other people's movies and take, blow all my money on fancy trips. Mm -hmm. And then just until I die, that's it. Like that's all there is for me. And I, I just, I really had, I guess, a, I guess you can't call it a midlife crisis for 31, but I, I definitely had like a, a, a moment where I, I just decided I had to change my life. Like I, I wasn't fulfilled. Mm -hmm. um, I was working to make rich people richer. That was my job. Um, and I just didn't want to do that anymore. And I miss performing. I miss doing the things I went to, to school for. Right. Um, and I said, well, you know what? You have this great opportunity now. You've made your money. Take some money. Invest it in yourself. Do absolutely everything that you know, necessary out of productions was created because I needed a, a creative outlet to me was necessary to my continued existence on this earth. So gotcha. I had to do it. Yeah. And I made this to continue to put out content. And then in terms of its scope, it had to be 100% me. So it had to be gay. It had to be honest. It had to be realistic. There was, there's no sugar coating. There's no fairy tales here. Um, and I won it because I'm self-financed and I learned all the skills myself. And it, it, it was the, it, it come, came with a great freedom. So it was just create all the things that you wish you had growing up, the shows that you wish you would have been able to watch or the, the songs you wish you would have written for older for the album. It was, the album Older is a 90s album in, mm -hmm. in tone, in the musicality, in how it's, how it's actually constructed the song order, the kinds of music that's on it, how we start with the big, bold dance tracks and move into the, the ballads and end with the sort of quiet storm, sexy time stuff. Like, it, it, it's kind of a Janet Jackson album <laughs> in terms yeah, yeah, of like yeah, how it's yeah. plotted. And that was intentional because I grew up, like I think a lot of us, loving female pop artists and why you know did we didn't have we had some but not many out open lgbt artists doing that i think i know no but that raises an interesting question because i think i don't know if it's a clear answer that if we had a a gay male pop icon doing absolutely everything Britney was doing. Would we love him as much as we love Britney? I don't know. Yeah, that's I don't know question. About, I don't know about that. I don't think we can just switch, make them look more like us and us still love them. I think there's more there to that. But what I wanted to do was create an album that I listened to and loved growing up, 
but coming from my perspective where the pronouns matched my experience mm -hmm. and seeing about the topics that I deal with. All right. Um, All right. So the songs are, you know, I'm, I'm sick of songs about dancing. I'm sick of songs about the club. I'm sick of songs about money. You know, these, I'm sick of songs about young love. Like these are songs about regretting in how you behaved in a prior relationship. These are songs about um, how to deal with people that want to pull you into their world and pull you into their drama. There's a song about the political climate right now. There are songs about it, 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 it's, it's more, I think, robust in terms of its subject matter, mm -hmm. but it's the album that I wish I had growing up coming from a gay man. Wow, that's amazing. And it takes a lot of courage to go do something like that. You know, as I, as I talk with people on the show, work with people individually, there's always this arc that happens and you kind of just made it happen. It was, you know, as I asked you why you did this, and yeah. arc is exactly the same thing as any coming out journey. There was like, okay, there was confusion in what you wanted to be doing. Then you got curious about where you wanted to go. And then it took some courage to say, I'm going to go and I'm going to walk away from not only musical theater, but now I'm going to walk away from my law life, which then as you did that, you had to become really confident in that. And of yeah. course, then as you became confident, you said, I'm committing to this. I'm going to go create something that is about how I see life, how I wish I could have seen life when I was in my younger year. And now you consistently show up in that, even if every day is like, shit, I'm doing all this myself. I'm raising yeah. funds because one of the things he's doing right now is he's got uh, uh, he's raising funds for the show and all this sort of stuff. But it is the epitome of the coming out journey. If I were to talk to somebody coming out, and a few of the listeners have heard me say this, but I'm going to take them through this because I think this is a perfect example. When you come out of a closet, it doesn't matter what fucking closet it is. You're going to start with confusion. Then you're going to get curious about, well, what would life look like if I did this? Then you're going to have to get the courage to do it. But I, even if you have the courage, you're going to have to have the confidence to stand in who you are and make it happen. And once you're in that confidence place, then it's commitment. I am committed to being who I am. I'm going to be this person. I am gay. I know this is who I am. I am lesbian. I am trans, whatever it is. And then every day is going to be about consistently showing up as yourself. And I love how you just kind of gave me the platform to walk people through that today on the show with that description, of how you came to doing what you're doing, because it is the journey and it's a daily. Yeah. Journey. I, yeah I call it the no fuck zone. Yeah. I'm in the no fuck zone. Like I'm going to do what I want to do. I have one life. I'm going to make every piece of art I've ever wanted to make. I'm going to make every movie, sing every song and either five people are going to listen to it or, or, 5,000 people are going to listen to it, but I don't care. This is what I want to do. And you're either along for the ride or you're not, because the more that you look around for permission, uh -huh. permission to do something, validation. And it, listen, I'm, I am not the person to be, to be lecturing anybody on seeking validation. I spent my entire twenties doing it through sex. I spent, you know, I spend my thirties now doing it through these, you know, projects, you know, I'm still a work in progress myself, but there's a point where the only person that can validate you is you. And once you get to that point, you can do anything just and should do and do and, and should do anything because once it doesn't matter whether who's watching it or who's doing it and the joy you get from doing it is just the act of doing it. That's when you're in the golden zone. Mm -hmm. One of my favorite, and this is, this is a Rickism. So every once in a while I throw out a Rickism, but one of my favorite <laughs> Rickism, Rickisms to throw out is, the more you look around for permission, the further you get from yourself. Yep. Because it's stupid. And I, and it drives me, I'm not, you said at the very beginning, we're not standing up here on some, you know, pulpit saying, here's how to do this. We're sharing our own experiences. Yeah. And trust me, folks, there are times I still look for permission. And then I have to catch <laughs> myself and go, if I keep pursuing this, what am I getting done? Absolutely nothing. So just go do this. Go do this, and, and the universe will either guide you to go that way more, or it'll put a roadblock, and then you got to accept the roadblock and go, okay, well, then now I'm going to take the permission and go this way. The thing that I think many of us, and I'm going to specifically talk to the gay men who are listening right now, is if you keep seeking permission, if you use sex, if you use alcohol, if you use drugs, if you use you know, material things, whatever it is. I'm not knocking any of those things because each piece of those plays some piece in how we evolve and become who we are. But if you keep using those things for permission and validation, you will never get to you. 
And until you can get to you, you will never have whatever it is you want. You won't have a relationship. You won't have the career you enjoy. You won't be pursuing the passions you want. You've got to give yourself permission to say, this is who I am. That's the only permission you have to give yourself. And screw everybody else. <laughs> I know that's really hard because there'll be some really hot guy one night at a bar and you're like, oh, wow, he, he's giving me that look. And really, it may be the only thing he's giving you that look for is the permission to come and, excuse me, fuck you. And then he'll be done. And if that's the permission you were looking for, great. Then embrace that and go, that's what I wanted for that night. But if it's all about that hunky guy and you got to give yourself permission to mold into what he wants for you, you're going to lose yourself and you are going to be miserable. And then you're going to wake up at 50, 60, 40, whatever that awakening day may be, which may never be for some people. And you're going to go, why did I seek that permission, that validation all those years when all I really needed to do was accept myself, plain and simple? Yeah. And it's really become, you know, it's the flip side of, of permission. It, you know, it, it, we, we, you talk, we talked in the beginning of the podcast about rejection and permission seeking. You know, those two things, they're married they're because mm-hmm. we're they deathly hand afraid. Hand hand. They go hand in hand. We're deathly afraid of rejection because we've been rejected our entire lives. Some by our family, some by our religion, some just by society at large. And we seek permission through multiple means throughout the rest of our lives to make up for that piece of our soul that was trampled in our youth because we internalized that rejection. So they were out there, please love me, please think I'm hot, please think I'm attractive, please think I'm, I have something worthwhile to say. And it, and as you said, I'm not preaching to anybody. I deal with this every day. Any nasty YouTube comment I get, and I get them mm-hmm. because there are trolls mm-hmm. in the world, sticks with me, and I have to. I have to work very hard to go read all of the love, and then know that all of the love outweighs all of the hate. Yeah. But it's a daily struggle. It hurts. You have to work through it. But divorcing yourself from all of that. I don't need your permission. I don't care whether you reject me or not. That's where your power comes from because then you can, you're invincible at that point. You can do anything. It's not maybe 100% achievable 100% of the time, but it's right. the goal to work towards. And it's really hard when you're trying to raise money, which is what I'm doing right now for the history web series. Um, we're 12 days away from, uh, we need 1200 more dollars to be able to fund season three of this LGBTQ show. That's all about gay men li- trying to live their lives and dealing with the internalized rejection and internalized homophobia that they've picked up, that we've all picked up throughout our lives. Um, so <laughs> talking about <laughs> rejection and permission, and here I am out there, you know, writing emails, trying to get people to donate to this campaign. So it's hard. It's a struggle. <laughs> yes, but the thing is, and, and I think this is a great place to bring this full circle, is you cannot experience acceptance without rejection. You can't have the history show thrive without having to go through the rejections. In fact, one of my favorite books, it's, it's one that I've used in my world of cells and everything else, but it's go for no 72 pages. I think it's the length of the book. And this guy writes about going for no, because the more you go for no, the more yeses you're going to get, but you can't go, okay, I'm going for this. And Oh, I get the no. Okay. I'm done. You can't do that. You've got to keep going. And it doesn't matter if it's about raising money. It doesn't matter if it's about going on dates. It doesn't matter if it means finding a husband, if it's about losing weight, whatever it is, changing jobs, finding a new career, leaving, you know, musical theater, going to the lawn and walking away and saying, this is what I'm going to do. And it has to come with some rejection along the way so that you can find the yes and what you're wanting to be in life. So, um, And it only takes one yes. For a exactly. lot of things, it only takes to getting to that one yes. And if I've got to go through 300 no's to get that one yes that gets mm-hmm. me what I want, then I'll do that. Fine. Mm-hmm. I'll fall on my face 300 times to get yep. that one success that I've been after. And that's how you got to do it. You're, if you're afraid of those no's, you will never get those yes. Absolutely. So as we wrap up here, Jack, I have one question for you that I think is, is actually really going to be great for the listeners. You've done a lot of different things. You've gone through this yes and no piece. You've, you've been in certain places with theater and then law and, and finding yourself. What is the thing you felt that you have learned most about yourself as you came around this circle, so to speak, of, okay, here's where I'm supposed to be? The thing that I have learned most about myself is that, and I think this is true for anyone, you really can do anything you put your mind to. 
Mm-hmm. I, a lot of the stuff that I do, I have absolutely no training and absolutely no experience. And it might take you a long time to learn it. And you might have to get a lot of help and you might have to ask people. But there aren't many things, uh, maybe like quantum physics and maybe right. brain surgery. surgery. Right. Very right. short. But right. there aren't many things. But I would even say, you know, maybe it'll take you 30 years to learn it, but you could. Mm-hmm. You know, like anything can be learned. You just have to have the ambition and the work ethic and the drive to do it. And that is the thing that separates people. For me, I look at myself in the mirror every morning and I say to myself, you know, whenever I feel, well, there's a better actor out there. and There's a better web series out there. And there's a better song that I wish I would have written. And there's a better this. I look in the mirror and I tell myself, well, the difference between you and those people is that I will never stop. Mm-hmm. It does not matter what roadblock I hit. I will never stop. And if I put my mind to it, I can learn and achieve anything. And that's what I've learned. I have learned nothing really scares me anymore because I know that if I put the time and effort into it, I can eventually get there. That's awesome. That's awesome. That's a great place to wind up. So if people want to connect you, see what's your website, Jack? So uh, necessaryoutlet.com is where the hub is for all of it. Um, But all of the content, if you just want to subscribe to Necessary Outlet on YouTube, Mm -hmm. that's where all the web series are. That's where music videos for all of the albums. Um, You can find me there. And I'm at Necess Outlet, abbreviated Necessary, Necess Outlet on Instagram. I don't do the other services because they're free. Cool. (laughs) Cool. That's awesome because, and we will, we will connect all that up on the webpage for everybody that's been listening. And Jack, I just want to say so cool to connect with you, man. I love your, your energy, the way you and I think is very similar and we are here to be the grand poobahs. So I just want to make sure everybody realized that we just delivered the Holy grail to all of you, which is complete bullshit. What I just said, but we hope that something, <laughs> something we said today really resonates with anyone gay or straight, but especially our gay brothers. If you've been listening to this and something struck a chord, we hope that it helps you find that way to go, go find your own no fuck zone, so to speak. So, um, so yeah. thanks so much for being here, Jack. I really appreciate it, man. Thanks for having me. All right, there you have it. Another episode of Life on Closet has come to an end, but that's okay. We're going to be back in just a couple of days sharing more stories, tips, tricks, and wisdom for helping you live your life on closet. And you know what? You can share it too. Just take a few moments if you like and if you believe in this podcast and share it with someone you know today. Share it from your phone, go share it on iTunes, Stitcher, wherever you are. Maybe even give us a rating review because you know what? It's all about the planet living their life on closet. I'm Rick Clemens, host of the show and the guy who helps you make those big, bold moves. And I hope you never stop stepping out, stepping up, and stepping in to living your life uncloseted. Catch you real soon. Take care, everyone.